Well, I know that most people uh, didn't know Alex uh, Zabotsky, uh, so I, uh, but I did to say a few words. Um, Alex was a member of the department, it uh, was well known a mathematician, and uh, his area was, uh, I would, uh, I should like, uh, topology. And uh, uh, without going to his, uh, to his, uh, to his, to his uh, mathematics, which I, uh, to me, I didn't know much, but I still remember his lectures. I didn't remember his specific lecture in, in this room that he talked about quantum maps. And I don't remember more or less the definition, and I will not bother you with that. But what I want to say that uh, Alex was one of the most charming persons I ever came across in my life. Uh, it, was, it was so nice, it was so delightful that I remember the shock that we had on one Friday that we arrived into the, to the institute at that time. Uh, you know, there is no internet, there is no email, and we came here to the Amitsur uh, algebra seminar on Friday morning, and we were told that Alex uh, had got killed in a car accident in the United States. He was on his way to give a colloquium talk. He was a sabbatical on his way uh, to, to give a talk, and there was a storm, and, uh, and he was killed in a car accident. This was very shocking uh, to all the oil bomb, and as I said, it was very charming. I have a very, uh, uh, also some personal stories with him. Uh, you can imagine that Alex Zabotsky and Alex Zabotsky in the same department was a, a main cause of uh, problems and misunderstanding. Um, what very few people know uh, that, that uh, Alex Zabotsky uh, had a, a completely different character. I don't know if, uh, if you, uh, some of the people may, may recognize, so, so, oh. so uh, uh, who is Alex Zabotsky? <laughs> Alex Zabotsky is the third person of the one right in, from, the, from the right and looks for us, and he looks at us, right? The, the, the one sitting here, this is Alex Zabotsky. Now, who is this guy and who is this guy? Did anybody recognize them? No, the one I told them. Yes, the one standing, I think, is Ali Kanshan. And the one sitting is Uri Zohar. Uh, uh, for, for, for you, these are one of the... This is like the Beatles of Beach Boys in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, Alex Zabotsky was a member of Lakata Nahal. And Lakata Nahal, to, to, I don't know if the answer still know, was B. Uh, uh, this was the, the, from the Beatles of the Beach Boys of Israel, and uh, this these two became so famous eventually. It seemed that uh, uh, Alex Zabotsky uh, decided not to follow the footsteps of Alec Einstein, but rather the footsteps of Albert Einstein <laughs> to come to work in the Einstein Institute of Mathematics. I'm sure that if if not for other things, Alex Zabrowski will, 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 uh, will ever be remembered as a trivia question. Who was the professor of mathematics who started his career in the Akatanacha? I think this is uh, pretty unique. And maybe because of that, or, or this is a kind of explanation why he was uh, uh, such a colorful and charming and outstanding teachers, lectures was like a stand-up comedy without being a comedian, but you know, knowing to expand and, and inspire. So many, many years uh, passed, uh, around, you know, the, 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 you know, 86. What? It was November 86. 86. So we are almost uh, 40 years, and uh, we're still missing, and now I will let ego eat the mathematical. Thank you. So now we will, but next from Princeton will talk about uh, general relativity. Okay. So um, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you for the introduction. So, well, Alex said that this will be a mathematical talk. 
Um, this is almost true. Um, you should think of it as an after lunch talk. So it will help you digest your food and relax a little bit in the afternoon. Hopefully you won't fall asleep. So um, the title of the talk, some things you always wanted to know about mathematical general relativity, but were too afraid to ask. So um, that's why it's not exactly a mathematical talk. It's not intended to be a survey. It's not intended to be comprehensive. It's just little snippets to give you an idea of what, let's say, mathematicians or some mathematicians are interested in when they think about general relativity. Now, um, to keep things light, I will have very few references in my talk. That's intentional. And in particular, I will follow a very strict rule of not referring to myself. So you won't see any references to myself. And in some sense, uh, on that account, I'm acting in opposition to another talk uh, where the person came out and at the beginning of the talk, he said, um, the subject, uh, the history of the subject that I'm going to talk about is very long and complicated. And therefore, I'm only going to refer to myself. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I won't do that. Very good, so let's start. So the first question is, what is special and what is general about general relativity? So let me quickly tell you how one goes from special to general relativity. So special relativity, what was it all about? Well, the idea behind that, and that's the idea of Einstein, was to uh, introduce the, the notion of principle of relativity. And the idea was to take to go from the Galilean group of symmetries, which are written up there, to the Lorentzian group of symmetries. Well, so we simply replace Galilean motions with Lorentzian motions. Corresponding transformations get replaced. These are Lorentzian transformations. And that's how you go from Newton to the special relativity to the Einstein in the form of special relativity. However, if you look at the early papers of Einstein, you won't see any Lorentz transformations there. You won't see mathematics there at all. It was mostly about trains, clocks, and so on and so forth. And it's only a little bit later, actually mostly uh, through the work of Minkowski and other mathematicians, that was, it was understood that special relativity was about Lorentz and transformations, and special rel relativity was about the geometry. But the geometry of what? The geometry of what we now call the Minkowski space. This is a geometry of R3 plus 1, endowed with the Lorentzian metric on it, so that's the standard Minkowski metric, what we call Minkowski metric on it. That's the flat metric, which looks very much like the usual Euclidean metric, except that one direction, the sign in front of it, is flipped to minus. And that's what makes it <coughs> Lorentzian metric instead of that. All right, now, uh, what about the geometry of Minkowski space? Why is it so different from, let's say, the geometry of Euclidean space? Well, the difference is very easy to explain. Because of this form of the metric, with one negative direction and three positive directions, we can actually split the whole space into three components. The component that sits inside this cone, and that these are the time-like directions. They, any, any vector that emanates from the origin and sits inside the cone has the property that its length is negative according to this metric. If you look at the vectors which sit in outside this cone, like this, these are space-like vectors. They have length which is positive. And finally, the two regions are separated by something which is known as the null cone. It's the space of null directions with the property that the length of those tangent vectors or real vectors is exactly equal to zero. And that's very, very different from what you see in Euclidean geometry. In Euclidean geometry, everything has positive or non-negative length. And therefore, you can capture, you can measure things by measuring length. In Lorentzian geometry, you cannot measure by measuring length because the length can be equal to zero. So that's the big difference. All right, very good. So now we're going to be, become a little bit more abstract, or a little bit more contemporary. Rather than thinking about Minkowski space in the form that I just shown you, we're going to try to um, be more efficient with it. And the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to take the whole Minkowski space, R3 plus 1, and we're going to compactify it. So the first picture is that we just did a compactification. And so what happens in the process of this compactification? Well, we did it so that we can actually draw it as a finite subspace of, well, in principle, it would be of R4. In this case, it's of R2. So now, what is special about this? There is the special here. The special points are the point I plus. That's called time-like infinity. 
That's where all the time like geodesics eventually escape. The very special line, which is the dotted line, and dotted line means that that's actually part of the unphysical boundary. That's what got compactified and brought from infinity. So this line is called the null infinity. This is where null geodesics or null curves all go as they, go, uh, they, as they escape to infinity. And of course, you have two of them. You have one which is future null infinity, and then you have one which is past null infinity. The difference is the following. You can have a null geodesic going this way, or you can have a null geodesic going that way. You can go forward in time, or you can go backward in time. Now here, you see that everything has two copies, but that's just an artifact that I'm still sort of trying to draw this as a four-dimensional space. If you do it properly, like it's done on the right, then you see there is only one copy of everything, because here, I literally suppressed the sphere S2, which is now a point in this, in this diagram. So this is a very, very contemporary way of thinking about specifically Minkowski space, especially, particularly on the right, I've drawn something which is known as the Penrose diagram. It's a, you take a space-time, you compactify it, you suppress two directions, and then you're left with something that can be drawn as a subset of R2. This line gamma is nothing else but the familiar axis of symmetry. This is the uh, fixed points of the action of SO3. Okay, so this will be helpful. But now that's special relativity. So what is general relativity? Well, general relativity takes the idea that special relativity is secretly all about geometry of Minkowski space and promotes it even further. It promotes it to the idea that general, that relativity should be about geometry, but not of a fixed space-time, but of an unknown space-time. The geometry itself becomes an unknown, and geometry itself is supposed to encode gravity. Okay. So, in general relativity, we think of, oh, sorry, we think of the, uh, both gravity, gravity and matter as described by the following objects. The manifold, four-dimensional Lorentzian manifold, so it's no longer Minkowski space R3 plus 1. It's some Lorentzian manifold M4. Metric G, which is no longer the standard Minkowski metric. It's some unknown metric G. And then finally, external fields which will represent matter. And the Einstein equations, which tell you what this manifold should be, it constrains the manifold. It's not an arbitrary manifold that will represent gravity. It's only the manifold with the property that the Einstein tensor, which is this expression equal to the Ricci curvature minus a half metric G times the scalar curvature, is equal to, well, the right-hand side. So let me explain what is written here. On the left, you sort of think that everything that has to do with geometry. On the right, everything that has to do with matter. And there is this little thing here which is sort of neither, in the sense that it has a, it's called this constant lambda, it's called the cosmological constant, and there is still a metric G, uh, which is, which is st so still about geometry. So um, the most familiar case is when lambda cosmological constant is equal to zero, and the energy momentum tensor of matter, T, is also equal to zero. In which case? What is alpha Oh, this is just indices. Indices. Ah, indices of the matrix. The indices of the matrix, yeah. So the Ricci curvature, it's a two tensor, so it has two indices, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, no, so the, the Latin indices are used for Riemannian geometry, and the Greek indices are used for the Lorentzian geometry. That's the convention. <laughs> That's the convention, yes. So IJ, is this, when you say the words IJ, I immediately think Riemannian geometry, and so <laughs> I stay away. Um, okay, so um, in the case, yeah, sorry. Yeah, exactly, yes. So the metric here, the metric G alpha beta, it's a Lorentzian metric. So if you, if you look at the tangent, so if you, if you diagonalize it, it's always of the form minus one plus one plus one plus one. So it's always of that, of that signature. That's a requirement. Um, all right, so in the case when the cosmological constant and the energy momentum tensor are equal to zero, you get the, uh, the usual what's called the Einstein vacuum equations, in which case, this would literally be equivalent to the statement that we're looking for a manifold which is Ricci flat. Ricci curvature should be equal to zero. That's in the case of vacuum uh, equation. Now, one should not be confused by the terminology. Even though they're called vacuum equations, it does not mean that they're vacuous. In other words, it is not the case that in that case, the only solution is Minkowski space. 
you have more solutions. You have plenty of Ricci flat manifolds which are different from a Minkowski space. But we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit. Okay, so um, I've written a couple of examples of potential matter fields that people like to use. Um, for instance, the Einstein scalar field, where you, uh, you add the, uh, just one degree of freedom in the form of a scalar field. You can add Maxwell field. You can add perfect fluid. So lots of models that, uh, let's say, people in astrophysics like to look at. For the most part, we'll be talking about the vacuum equations, for the most part. Yeah. Okay. Now, cosmological constant, setting it equal to zero, or not setting it equal to zero, that's a big debate. Uh, current observations, for instance, suggest that the cosmological constant should be slightly positive with a very, very tiny value, uh, uh, very, val very tiny value of it. But um, for all intents and purposes, for us, cosmological constant, we, we'll treat the cosmological constant uh, the way Einstein treated it, which is, uh, he called it his biggest blunder. But uh, so for me, lambda will be equal to zero during this talk. That's probably the most popular model which is studied where lambda is simply identically equal to zero. Very good. So now let's look at geometry. So geometry of general relativity. Well, we can look at examples. Certainly, the special relativity is a subset of general relativity. Uh, it's a manifold which has a metric on it, which is indeed Ricci flat. And so it's a solution of the Einstein vacuum equations. And we can draw it the same way that we drew it before. That's very good. We've been through that example already. Now, here is one more interesting example, a non-trivial example. So Schwarzschild space-time, the metric here is written explicitly, not that it should tell you much. And I've also drawn a Penrose diagram of this space-time. So let me tell you a little bit about this space-time. This is a solution of the Einstein vacuum equations with zero cosmological constant. So this is Ricci flat. This is a Ricci flat manifold. It has an interesting topology. And it has an interesting non-trivial metric on it. Um, I don't want to discuss its topology, but I do want to point out one big difference between the diagram of Minkowski space and the diagram of Schwarz, which will be very helpful for later. You see, if you look at these two diagrams, you can sort of see that uh, if you simply take this part of the diagram, first of all, in Schwarz, you see that everything is sort of, it's mirror repeated. So don't look on the left. The left is just the mirror copy of what you see on the right. So if you look at the right, and if you drew this line, vertical line right here, then it would look like Minkowski space. It sort of looks like the subset of Schwarzschild is Minkowski space. And it's not entirely inaccurate in the sense that, yes, the Schwarzschild space time also has future null infinity. It has past null infinity, the same way as Minkowski. It has future time-like infinity and the past time-like infinity. But it has this interesting thing here, it has a new region which, is, which does not appear in Minkowski space. This region right here, it's the black hole region. And the black hole region is characterized by a very interesting property. If you take any point in this black hole region and imagine that this point is a source of light, the light would propagate like this or it would propagate like this in the, uh, to the future. From that point on. You see that the light, if it starts inside the black hole, it only stays inside this region. It does not escape. So the black hole is exactly characterized by a property that it's a subspace, it's a region of space where the light cannot escape to future uh, future color things. That's the more or less characterization of black hole. And of course, the black hole itself ends in this dotted line here, which indicates that it actually ends in the square area. So Schwarzschild is an example of a space time which is which has a black hole region. And the black hole region ends in the singularity. It's an example of the singular space. All right. Now, of course, you can ask me about this region. That region is called the white hole, and it also ends in the singularity, but it's to the past. Uh, and as, uh, as my friend Mihal is emphasized to say, he likes to say that, but since uh, we are progressives, we always, we always look to the future. So we never look to the past. So I'm not focusing on the past, I'm only, I'm only focusing on the future. So black hole, which ends in the future All right, very good. So, yeah? What is the best way to do this? Yes, so the, the, the line that separates the black hole, let's say, on the right, uh, from the exterior region is called the vector horizon. 
And then the point of intersection is indeed, it's not a point because every point of this diagram is a sphere. This is actually a sphere with non zero radius, and it's called the bifurcate sphere. So, this is the sphere where the, the event horizons, the future event horizons, meet, and they also meet the past event horizons. So, if you want, typically, when you, when you try to picture the topology of this, let's say you want to, uh, if you so if you drew the uh, space like at the surface through this, through the bifurcate sphere, then what you would see is the following picture. The space like at the surface would come like this, and then it would do this, and it would go up. So the bifurcate sphere is the sphere which, is, which sits in the throat of this house. It's literally the throat. Okay, so um, what is mathematical general? Well, it's a study of the space of solutions to the Einstein equations and the associated geometric model. What is not, what it is not, is that it's not a construction or a study of explicit solutions. Now, you certainly have plenty of explicit solutions, but mathematicians, we do not want, it's not our purpose to construct special solutions or explicit solutions to the Einstein equations. That's, that's the domain of physicists. They can play with explicit solutions. And it's also not modeling with approximate alternative or high order schemes of theories. Again, if you, let's say, if you do physics, then you might make an argument that the Einstein equation is a general theory of relativity. That's not an exact theory, that's just an approximate theory. And if you're interested in high energy physics, then it's just a first order in the theory series expansion. And because of that, you need to add higher order terms to your theory, which will take derivatives of curvature and so on and so forth. That's no, that's all nonsense, basically. And uh, it's nonsense in the, in, the, in the rather precise mathematical sense. Is because when you, if you do that, you will actually end up with a theory which will be closed. The beautiful uh, aspect of the of, of theory of general relativity from the mathematical point of view is that it's complete theory, and it is mathematically related. Okay, so then how do we study the space of solutions? Well, we see. Studied for the most part through the prism of the Cauchy problem in general relativity. So, what is the Cauchy problem? How do we think about this manifold which is supposed to be Ricci flat or maybe Ricci equal to something? Well, we think of it as an initial boundary problem where we have a three dimensional hypersurface, Riemannian hypersurface, with the Riemannian metric G0 on it, and a second fundamental form K0. Which will tell us how this space like hypersurface will be embedded into a one more dimensional manifold. And um, we, we're going to start with the data given on that hypersurface, and then we're going to solve, we're going to construct a two dimensional manifold, which is horizon, such that it's reaching out. And as a result, we will that way construct a solution which corresponds to this initial data. So we'll try to parameter the space of solutions of uh, the Einstein equations through the space of the initial data for uh, well, sorry, uh, yeah. physics that's the equivalent of what they do first year mechanics that we have initial yes. and evolving time. Absolutely. Yes. This is an evolution problem, a uh, classical evolution problem. So you're supposed to give yourself initial conditions. Uh, we say initial data in this case because it's infinite dimensional. Uh, give yourself initial conditions and then you determine the solution. Exactly the same way as you do with the equations. When you say, for example, the Riemannian three many problems, any one, there is Riemannian compact, non compact. Precisely. So there is a lot of volume that is solved for whatever. So it depends on what exactly you want to study. So the, I'm going to show you the second example. But for instance, when people study isolated gravitational systems, you should think that uh, that manifold is basically decomposed to R3 minus O with the metric which approaches Euclidean and infinity. So, sigma naught, the three dimensional Riemannian manifold, more or less at infinity, which should look like R3 in the case of isolated gravitational systems. If you want to study a uh, slightly more interesting, well, but slightly, slightly different examples, slightly different class of examples, you can think that this is this manifold should be asymptotically capable. That would be the case if the cosmological constant was negative, then you would study so-called anti-supersystems, 
and that, that is, this, this will be a whole type of data set. But the metric that we strive for it is not a standard metric, it's more or less any metric. That's the interest. Because remember, we try to parameterize the space of solutions. We start with initial data, which is almost arbitrary, and then we want to evolve. So, so there is a, like, a few way of saying that starting with yes. such an initial that is a nickel solution of yes. the yes. You will see it, you will see it there. I promise you, you will see it there. Which will tell you exactly how. Alright, but before you see that there, you will see a painting. Uh, what is this painting? Well, I don't know if any of you will recognize this uh, or this painter. Um, so, this is a painting by Richter. And this is just my way of interpreting what this is about. So, for me, in this painting, this yellow is my initial data. This is my Riemannian manifold, and I'm starting to use Riemannian manifold, and I'm starting to paint. I'm starting to paint from it, and I end up with this thing. This is my, this is my, um, this is my solution. This is my manifold four. This is my initial data. And you will see, uh, you will see. Yeah. Uh, but so, what what languages do we use? So, how do we study? How do we construct the space of solutions? What method do we use? So, the first language that we speak, at least that's the, that's the language that comes most naturally to me specifically, is the PDE language. The PDE perspective tells you that we should think of the Einstein equations not as a manifold, but simply as a PDE. It's, you think of the Einstein equations and you think of it as a system of nonlinear evolution. So, what kind of PDEs are those? How do you, what are they? The fact that with something for each curvature is equal to zero, how, how does that be? Well, so here's the way to think about it. And the way of that way of thinking about it is very, very old. It goes back to Hilbert, actually. And the way to think about it is to try to understand what happens in the case when your metric is just a small perturbation of the Minkowski metric. So M here is the Minkowski metric, and H is the perturbation. It turns out that it's more convenient to introduce this auxiliary quantity rather than working with H. You introduce this auxiliary quantity gamma, which is just this combination of H and mu and L. Right? It's just H minus its first. And then you write down the linearized action. So this is the equation for each carriage is equal to zero, but to linear work. And you see here that it's the first term you like because it's something that you recognize. It's box applied to Components of gamma. And box is nothing else but the wave operator on the equation space, minus the t squared plus something else. But then you notice that there are a bunch of terms here which also contain second derivatives of gamma. So if you want to think about the principal symbol of this operator that acts on gamma, it looks like it's not the term. The first term sort of suggests that maybe it's hyperbolic, but since these are second derivatives, you don't know what to and then one of the big insights of specifically Hilbert, but of course it all goes back to the idea of Einstein, uh, that the, the theory that we constructed is a covariant theory. In other words, it's by nature it's a geometric theory, which means that you can view that uh, theory in any system of coordinates. That's the principle of relativity. The laws of physics should be exactly the same, independent of the coordinates. So because the theory is covariant, it means that the group of TPM morphisms is acting on the space of solutions. And because it's acting on the space of solutions, you can quotient it. And quotient it literally means taking the choosing equation. And so, in this case, if you choose what's known as the Hilbert gauge, you can simply require this, that this gamma has the its divergence strip. So, again, another convention. When indices are repeated, there's some over. Okay? So, this is literally a divergence. So divergence of gamma is equal to zero, that's the reflection of covariance, and then lo and behold, you end up with this. All those annoying terms disappear, and all you're left with is the uh, equation which tells you that the box of the component of gamma is equal to, well, whatever you have on the right hand side. And yeah. It's perfect, right? So all the, all, all the geometry here is because. Exactly. It is perturbed, and therefore the background geometry here is in cost. Absolutely. Yeah. So, the question if, if it would have perturbed, must be on the cost state, like an yeah. idea essentially, which is not flat, but I'm just teaching that, then this gave me the same. 
you will have, you can choose a, a similar gauge and you will end up with a similar equation where box would be replaced by the box on that background. But yes, you can choose a similar gauge. And it's consistent, I mean, you might solve this equation and then uh, check if it satisfies the gauge. Yes, the gauge is propagated, indeed. Again, to the linear order. Yes. 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 Um, all right, so then what it tells you about is that the um, theory, general theory of relativity is a hyperbolic theory. If you introduce perturbations, if you take if you take a space time and you just kick it gently somewhere, then that kick will propagate. The geometry will ripple. It will propagate like ripples, and that's that's therefore that's the picture. Okay. So this is what happens. All right. So that was the PVD perspective. Now, of course, so we can solve the Einstein equations by viewing the metric itself as the unknown and writing down a system of equations on it, which, as I hopefully convinced you, I have parabolic equations. Uh, but then we can, we can, of course, think about our manifold as a manifold and study it from the geometric point of view. And so then we start talking about time like, space like, geometry lessons, we can talk about all kinds of sources, we can talk about general diagrams that I already explained. We can talk about curvature. We have all geometric concepts. So in PDE, we don't have this concept, but we can supplement the PDE picture with the geometric picture and uh, describe it like this. So, uh, one aspect of the geometry that I want to talk about very quickly is exactly the aspect of the geometry of initial data. So, um, we have initial data, which is the Riemannian manifold sigma law, the metric on it, and the second fundamental theory. It turns out, the, the Einstein equations tell you that the data is not arbitrary, that you cannot prescribe arbitrary data. The, uh, you have constraint, what's called the constraint. And this is the system of constraint. Now, if you look at it, and for simplicity, I assume for a second that k0 is equal to 0, and trade, so k0 is equal to 0. Then this line is equal to 0, and then this two terms are also equal to 0. That tells you that in this case, the uh, the scalar, reminding scalar curvature of initial data should be equal to zero. So, more generally, if you relax certain things, then you'll realize that the constraint equations are intimately related with the study of reminding geometry of manifolds of positive scalar curvature. Okay. So, and that's a pretty vast and very active subject of reminding geometry. One of the motivations for it is studying it's very much related to the study of the space of initial data for the actual. So let me give you an example. The example would be the following. Well, the first example is trivial. Uh, if you take R3, you take a standard Euclidean metric on it, that gives you the data for the process. Very good. We can try to generalize this again. So this is what's known as asymptotically flat initial data, which models isolated self validating system. And this, sigma naught, if you subtract off a compact set, it should be TFM naught to R3 minus 4. And what about the metric G naught? Well, we wanted to approach Euclidean metric at infinity. So what we can do at infinity is that we can start Taylor expanding. The first term is the Euclidean metric. The next term should decay as one power of R. So we write it in the form constant M over R and again times the plus something which decays faster. And you can assume that K naught decays uh, with uh, infinity as well. So it turns out that in this case, if you assume this expansion, and you assume that the constraint equation is satisfied, it turns out that that's, it dictates that M has to be non negative. That's known as the positive mass term. And moreover, if M is equal to zero, then in that case, actually, it's exactly the Euclidean measure. So, um, all right. That's the, if you want, that, that's a little snippet about the, uh, the language of reflection geometry, or language of geometry uh, in the studies of general relativity. Now, what about physics? Well, we use it too, because we talk about an observed forest. That's a physical term. It denotes causal geometry. We talk about determinism. That's a very one of the favorite uh, physics notions, uh, which was already alluded to. When you prescribe initial conditions and then you construct a solution, you expect your solution to be uniquely determined by your initial data. This is what we expect here too. We expect to prescribe the initial data and determine the solution uniquely from that initial data. This is known as determinism. There are notions <coughs> like redshift, there is surface gravity, all kinds of 
different parts, and some of them will be explained a little bit later. Alright. Okay, so that's that was about languages that we speak in. But when we speak this language, what does it sound like? So in other words, how do we do it? So I want to give you two examples. <coughs> and the two examples have to do with all. They correspond to two ways of thinking. One is what I call teleological way, and the other one is the evolutionary way. Let me explain what, what, what is the teleological way of thinking about general theory of relativity. That way of thinking was very, very popular uh, in the, uh, maybe starting from the 1950s up until maybe 1990s uh, in the physics group. And that way of thinking is the following. You assume that the manifold M is given to you. Let's say that it's reaching five. You assume that it's given to you in its entirety. You assume certain properties of this manifold, and then you try to grow the conclusions. That's teleology. So maybe the most famous example of this way of thinking is the theorem of Penrose from 1965. Uh, it's typically called the singularity theorem. That's, that, that's an incorrect name for it. It's really, it really should be called, and this is what I'm calling it, it's an incomplete mistake. And it says the fall. You assume that the matter satisfies the non energy equation. Doesn't matter what it is. If matter is not present in your system, then there is nothing to assume. So in particular, for binding equations, it's always satisfied. You assume that you have a your space that contains a non-compact Cauchy type of surface. So in other words, that the manifold of initial data on which initial data is given to you is non-compact. That's an assumption. And finally, and that's the teleological assumption. You assume that your spacetime contains what's known as a trapped surface. And I'll explain this in a second. Then, the conclusion that we can draw from, and it is really a striking conclusion, it tells you that M has to be geodesically equal. So, why is this called, why, why, why do people call it a singularity? Because they sort of interpreted the fact that it's incomplete as a way of saying that the manifold M contains a singularity. They, this theorem does not tell you what happens with the manifold. It just tells you that there are geodesics that will be incomplete. It doesn't tell you that you actually have a singularity. So the proper mathematical way of referring to this is an incomplete mistake. So this was a funny enough, this is basically the theorem for which Penrose was awarded the Nobel Prize in physics. This is the season result from 1960. Alright, so um, why is this result so striking? Because up until this week, up until this theorem, the only examples of space times where, where we incomplete geodesic non trivial examples was basically Schwarzschild space time. I told you that Schwarzschild space time terminates in the singularity. So there are geodesics there that are incomplete because they run into the singularity in five times. So the conjecture was that Schwarzschild space time is extremely symmetric. It has, it has an SO3 symmetry. And so the thinking was that maybe. You have examples of singular space times in general relativity, but these examples have to be somehow very symmetric and very unstable. This theorem tells you immediately that in, uh, incompleteness is a very stable phenomenon because having a trapped two dimensional surface is actually an open condition. So, for instance, any space time near Schwarzschild would have to be incomplete immediately. Okay, so now the only thing that remains for me is to explain to you what a trapped surface is. Well, here's an explanation. <laughs> um, not that it's uh, yes. So let me try to explain. Okay. So first of all, you should what is this result? What do I have? It relies on the evolution equation for a concourse of knowledge of this. Take the analog of Jacobi equation, the Riemannian geometry. And there is a monotonicity, embedded monotonicity in the Asha case, which goes by the name Rachel Uri. Again, think of the Jacobi equation. Which tells you that certain things have to have to become bad after a while. So the correct comparison is here is with the Bonnet Myers and the Bonnet Myers geometry. If that's all familiar. Okay, so a trapped surface. So what is a trapped surface? A trapped surface, for simplicity, let's think of a sphere, this two-dimensional surface sitting in our four-dimensional space time. When you take a sphere in the Hobson space, you can Evolve it in two null directions, in two ways. You can either go out in the null direction or you can go in. Right? And in the constant space, what you see is that when you evolve your sphere out, then the area increases. And when you evolve it in, the area decreases. Now, a surface is defined to be trapped 
if what you infinitesimally evolve it in either non or non directions, then the area decreases in volume. Okay, so the claim is that, of course, you don't have any trap surfaces in the cross systems. That's very consistent with theorem of Penrose because Penrose tells you that there's no problem like this. Right? You don't have any trap surfaces, you don't have any problems. It tells you that if you have a trap surface, then you have a problem. So the Schwarzschild space time has the property that every sphere that is inside the black hole region is trapped. The gravity is so strong there, the curvature <coughs> is so strong there, that it bends the geometry in such a way that you have spheres such that they cannot escape, they cannot go out. The area in either direction decreases. So that's what the graphs are. Now, remember, so the theorem of Penrose tells you that you have all of this provided that the trap surface exists in your space. But how can we put it there? In particular, the big question is, and this is where I want to switch and talk about the Instead of being logical, I want to talk about the evolutionary point. So, what is an evolutionary point? The evolutionary point you ask the question, I give you the initial data, you construct the space time for me, and then you tell me from my initial data is something going to happen on me. So, in this case, I would expect you to say the following Give me the initial data, fine, let it be defined on the non compact Cauchy kind of surface. I don't want to have any, any trapped surfaces in my initial data. Can trap surfaces form in evolution? In other words, is this assumption reasonable? Can this trap, trap surfaces arise from regular initial data? This theorem does not answer this question. This theorem cannot answer this question because it simply is super. That's a theorem from 1965. Now let me show you a theorem from 2008. Theorem from 2000, 2008. Pale tells you that indeed you can form trap surfaces in evolution. You can construct initial data such that the initial data is not trapped, but then eventually becomes trapped. So here's the picture. You start with a sphere, which is not trapped. That's the usual picture. And then you start evolving it, and the curvature starts bending this light cones. First it bends it so that it goes vertical. One of the slides. And then it bends it even more, and so now you see, you evolve it in this direction, the area decreases, you evolve it in this direction, the area decreases even more. Now, there's a very good reason why it took more than 40 years to go from the theorem of Penrose to the theorem of Christopher. Completely different now. So if you look at the paper of Penrose, that paper is five pages long. Um, if you look at the uh, theorem of uh, Christopher, that's not a paper, that's a book. And uh, if I remember correctly, it's five months. And that book is devoted simply to the proof of this exact book, nothing. Um, all right. So that's the picture. This is you start from initial data. The initial data initially is not trapped. So you have this spheres sitting in this initial data. And then you start evolving them. And there is one sphere here which eventually becomes trapped. And once it becomes trapped, then it will tell you that there will be incompleteness in the future. Well, we don't know what happens in this incompleteness. And that's why there's a limbo. You don't know, maybe there will be a singularity. People typically say that there will be a black hole. Penrose does not tell you that there will be a black hole. And all, any, the only thing he tells is that there will be two things. Okay. Now, let me criticize the teleological approach a little bit more. So, the claim here is that you have to have, you have to have, it's a very truthful approach because your assumptions are correct. Then you can draw wonderful conclusions like Penrose did. But if you are a little bit uncareful with what you assume a priori, you may end up with complete nonsense. And I'm just going to give you an example of that. So, at a certain point in time, it was very popular to talk about what's known as asymptotic simplicity. So, which is that it's very tempting to think that any space time can be conformally compactified so that you can actually draw it with a Penrose diagram. But there is a problem here. The conformal compactification. If it's smooth, it implies asymptotic behavior of field of field technology, which is not the physical as field. So there's a certain behavior of fields the way they feel. Well, it turns out that this PD corresponds to non-generic behavior. In other words, if you start with generic initial data, you should not expect a manifold 
to be a Satori Prism. That's more or less important at this point. So, yes, if you assume that you can, become, you can smoothly conform with a particle, you can draw wonderful conclusions, but it turns out that's not realistic. That's not, that does not happen in a pathology area. Alright, so, so what do we study? What kind of questions do we study? Well, we study questions in reminding the law of Lawrence and John. Like, well, some of the things I already mentioned, positive mass law, initial data engineering, Penrose inequality, splitting theories, horizons, so that's a geometric problem. We study evolution problems, uh, geometry and hyperbolic evolutions, the type of questions that we address, existence of solutions, formation of singularity, stability questions, rigidity questions. And the claim is that in the end, at least for me, it's all about global properties of maximum machine development. So I need to tell you what maximum machine development is. So here is this picture of So let me show you what I mean by maximum machine development. This is my Cauchy data right here. I start solving. And I solve for as much as I can. And it will become rigorous maybe on the next slide. What does it mean as much as I can? So I keep solving until I cannot go anymore. And at that point, I declare this to be maximum pushing development. In other words, solve as much as you can until you reach the borders, the natural borders of your solution. And if you can't keep solving, if you cannot keep drawing this, then that's a maximum pushing development, and I need to study. What do I need to study about? Well, I need to study how big it is. And more important, maybe most important, I need to understand why I have to solve. Why there is a boundary? What happens at the boundary? Okay, so let me unru unwrap some of these things a little bit more precisely. And here's a theorem that I promised us about the uh, existence of solutions corresponding to initial data. So again, we start with initial data, as usual, as before, sigma mod, g mod, k mod. And here's a theorem. And this theorem is a theorem of Shakir Block from 1952 plus. Uh, a result from a Shakespeare law and a Yerush law from 69. And what it tells you is that if you give me initial data like this one, if you assume that they satisfy constraints, which we already talked about, then any such initial data can be extended to a unique solution. And moreover, you can make that solution to be maximum. So, and the maximality is actually the way of there. So what does it mean here, Max? It turns out that you can establish a partial order of the space of all possible extensions, all possible solutions, and then you can find a maximum value uh, in there. So um, how was this theorem, how have this theorem been proved? Well, I basically already showed you the proof of that theorem when I talked about linearized Einstein equations. You just need to do exactly the same thing, but now at the non-linear level, and you will be in business. So you exploit covariance, which allows you to impose a gauge condition. And the gauge condition is just a non-linear generalization of what I showed you as a Hilbert gauge. This is just a non-linear version of the Hilbert gauge. This is known as the harmonic gauge. And it's simply a requirement that the, each coordinate of your, on your manifold satisfies the weight condition. And then you uh, realize that if you impose this gauge, then under this gauge, the Einstein equations, they become a system of quasi-linear weight equations for each component of natural This is G because of the initial environment, right? But if it is an inconstant, it's permanent and definitely it always absolute value. It's absolute value, yes. Okay. So that's not a reminder matter. And that absolute value there is for that precise person. No, for first. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, so it's a system of weight equations, and well, certainly we know how to solve weight equations now. In 1952, it was a bit more complicated um, because this is still a quasi-linear wave equation, so, but, but people already knew how to do it. Um, so that, that's why it is. So we're on so including here. You give me initial data, any initial data, as long as you satisfy constraints, I can always give you a unique solution and I can make it maximum. So what is the global structure of the Cushing problem? So you saw, you found your maximum, maximum space time. This maximum space time will have a boundary beyond which you cannot go. So why can you not go? What's at the boundary there? So there are a couple of features that people typically draw. So, well, one example that can happen is exactly what happens in Schwarzschild's solution, which is 
We started with initial data. We solved it. This is all very nice. This is inside our maximum push development, and then we reached the boundary. Well, this boundary, that's not a physical boundary because that's an infinity. So there we just we just subtracted that. However, this boundary is very much not an infinity. This is where we have to stop. And in this case, we stop because there was a singularity. Short just based on black hole region ends in the singularity. So we went there and the curve should go up, literally. Okay, that's not a bad outcome. We know that can happen. And from a physical perspective, this is not a bad outcome. Why? Well, because the singularity sits inside the black hole. So first you have to enter the black hole, and then, well, once you enter the black hole, the outside world has no idea what happens to, to you inside the black hole because everything that's inside the black hole is hidden from the rest of the world. So if you ended up in the singularity, well, that's your misfortune. But we don't care about it because we're outside. However, there's something more pathological that can happen. And the more, the, the more pathological thing is depicted here. So it could be that instead of this picture, you have this picture. So this is still, this line is still at infinity, so this is okay. There is a singularity here, that, like here, but there is this region right here. And this region, it's the boundary, it's depicted at 45 degrees, which tells you that it's null. And it, it is not at infinity, it's a finite distance. And nothing goes up in that boundary. So what happens at that boundary? Well, that piece of boundary is only Koshikomite. And what happens is that you, your solution can be extended past the Cauchy horizon. However, the problem is that the extension is not equal. So, determinism is violated. If such boundary is present, then determinism will be violated because determinism means that we can uniquely determine what happens with our solution from the So, right, I said that this may happen. But that's, that's what actually happened. The answer is yes. Moreover, we in fact we have an explicit example of a space time that can be written down where a Cauchy horizon exists. And the solution can indeed be extended beyond the Cauchy horizon in no means fashion. So, well, we have an example, but can we understand the logic of the problem? And how do we deal with that? How do we rule it out? How do we how do we how do we reconcile physics with this problem? I'll try to address it. We address it by the usual way we address things that we don't understand. We formulate conjectures. And there are two main conjectures in the area of general relativity. At least when it has to do with, let's say, initial data, which looks like when, when you try to understand gravitation from us. In other words, when you deal with the data, which is. Oh, I'm sorry, what time do I have to say? Uh, five, ten minutes. Okay. Um, so, with initial data, which has the topology of R theory. So, there are two of them. One is called weak cosmic censorship conjecture. The weak cosmic censorship conjecture tells you that for generic initial data, if you look at the maximum shooter level, if it has singularities, then all singularities should be inside black holes, like it is for Schwarzschild's okay. Now, the key word here is generic. And then there is a strong cosmic censorship. That tells you that for generic initial data, black holes terminate in singularities. So, in particular, there are no Cauchy horizons. What generic means? Exactly. So, I'll have to explain. All right. So, um, let me make a couple of comments, and then I'll the, the rest of the slides will be sort of uh, expansion on, on all of this concept. So, first of all, both of these injections were put, were, were put forward in the 70s, initially by Penrose. And initially, they did not have the word generic. Because he believed, even though the evidence, it was a huge leap of faith, because the evidence for these injections was very, very tiny. Nonetheless, he put forward this injection. Um, the word generic had to be added later on because people constructed counter examples. So then they were sold by adding the word generic. Now, the problem is that at the moment we're working with an infinite dimensional space of solutions. So we need to define a notion of genericity in infinite dimensional space of solutions. That's not very well defined, even today. We have certain examples, 
where we, we have a good notion of what generic means. Um, in some cases, for instance, it can be a bare category. In some cases, we can even be more precise than that. But there is not a settled notion of what generosity means at the moment, or should mean at the moment for those two conjectures. Second problem is that even though one is so weak, the other one is so strong, there is no order between the experiment. They deal with different phenomena. Okay? One deals with what happens outside the black holes in some sense, and the other one deals with what happens inside. Because this, the claim is that, well, why does it deal with uh, something that happens outside the black hole? Because it says that the singularities that occur outside the black holes are particular. There should not be a law. And by the way, why is this called censorship? Well, it's because you think that uh, there's a cosmic sensor that suppresses bad people. Or it is generic. <clears throat> so why are these conjectures different? Why are we pretty far away from being able to solve them in full general? Well, the reason has to do mostly with analytic justice. Because, first of all, we need to be able to understand how to solve evolution problems with generic machine data. We don't have, well, first of all, I already said that we don't even know what generic means, strictly in this case. But generally speaking, when we talk about EDs, we have a hard time solving them for, for generic machine data. We know how to solve them maybe for general machine data and get some results. But to show that some, some, some behavior is generic is very hard. And it's not just a picture of, let's say, hyperbolic problems. It's not easy, let's say, to identify hyperbolic problems. What we sort of do understand much better are sort of being able to solve evolution problems for nearly specific machine data, which means not generic, but let's say close to something which we know. Like, for instance, we can understand stability problems near Minkowski, carry two body problems, singularity equations. All right, so now let me explain a few things. So again, let me come back to the notion of what is black Well, here is a black Let me be a little bit more rigorous than that. So the mathematical definition, the interesting thing is that the mathematical definition of a black hole has nothing to do with what you will read, not just in popular language, but even when you speak to astronomers. For that, black hole is completely different. For that, a black hole is something whose creation for parts of people who, uh, you know, when you read something in astrophysics, they will use the words, oh, we see a black hole being created. A broken mathematical definition of a black hole is global. So in other words, you cannot see a black hole being created. In order to determine whether your spacetime has a black hole or not, you need to first know its global structure. And only then, you can say, yes, there is a black hole region in that space. So like here, for instance, in order to determine whether there is a black hole in this space, at first, we need to understand, we need to look at this whole diagram. We need, we need to, in particular, we need to know that there is this future null infinity, which looks like this. And the black hole is this region which is adjacent to future null infinity, but it's not contained. In other words, it has no signal from the inside the black hole can propagate the future null infinity. So that's why this definition is global. So don't believe people to tell you that they can see creation of a black hole. That's a different way. That's not about that. All right, we have examples, right? We have Schwarzschild, there is a black hole in Schwarzschild, there is a black hole in here. What is a singularity? Well, that's a very, very loaded question because we, again, we have a hard time defining what a singularity is. The primary reason for the or is what I already said before. In Lorentzian geometry, it's very difficult to measure something because the geometry of Lorentzian, so there is no notion of length. So why do I say that? Because the easiest thing to, to measure singularity would be to say something goes to infinity. Some good geometric quantity blows up, like curvature blows up. But the problem is, in Riemannian geometry, you can rule the relationship between curvature blows up. You can look at its absolute value and say, if that goes to infinity, then that's similar. In Lorentzian geometry, there is no notion of absolute value of a tensor because that's not a positive vector constant. We don't know, there is, no, there is no good notion. So the only thing really you can do is that you can look at the curvature invariance. Okay? But it is possible that maybe curvature invariance is fine, 
And nonetheless, something is blowing up. So that is why it's actually rather tricky. Um, the other tricky part is that it also depends on the notion of what you mean by CPI, how regular or non regular you want to measure it. Like, right? for instance, curvature blowing up. Well, in principle, maybe curvature is going to infinity, but that's, that could be an acceptable solution. There are certainly examples of that where curvature is big, becomes very big, but there's nothing wrong with the solution. We can extend it even after the curvature blew up. So, that's just to illustrate the point that it's not, it's not easy. Um, can singularity swap? Well, again, we know, we already know the answer to that. Yes, for instance, in short, um, some black hole space times terminate in singularities. The examples of that that go back to Oppenheimer and Snyder in 39. And then there are general results going by Christy Google in 91 in spherical symmetry for the nine shot zero three. All right, so now let me tell you the conjecture. So why, I told you that initially, for instance, the weak must be conjecture, that the similarities have to be hidden inside black holes, was formulated without the word generic. Why did it have to be modified? Because there, was, there were counterexamples. The first counter, counterexamples came from basically this work of Christian Dulu in spherical symmetry with a scale. So the example of similarity that is not hidden inside the black hole is called the main similarity. And so Christian Dulu constructed examples of naked similarity for the small. The big question that remained open is, well, okay, that's for the small, that's spherical symmetry, you might have a scale of two. Are they possible in fact? Do you need to work have the word generic in fact as well? And the answer is yes, but that's very, very easy. So these are examples of that. All right, so let me explain or give you a picture of what naked singularity is. So here's a picture where the singularity is not there. It's inside the black hole. And it's a whole surface. Now, here's an example of the naked singularity. You, the naked singularity here is this O. So why is it naked? Because the light of the signal from O can propagate to future knowledge things. So this dotted line, that's the signal that can propagate to light mass. In here, this singularity, the uh, the, the, the future non infinity is here. Nothing propagates from inside the black hole to future non infinity. Here, things propagate from future non infinity. That's the thing, singularity. There is no black hole region. And you can construct such examples. Now, the saving rays is supposed to be they are unstable. If you perturb the initial data, then they immediately get covered up by a black hole. In vacuum, that has not been proven. For the Einstein scale of football and spherical symmetry, Chris Dulu put the different times. That that is indeed the case, that those similarities are unstable. And therefore, generically, so he proved weak cost exception, he proved that generically, in a very precise sense, in spherical symmetry, which you can do, uh, weak cost exception holds. Here's another example of here's another picture of the naked similarity. So, okay, so we have this, we have weak crossing symmetry now strong crossing symmetry. Koshika lattice. Remember that the strong crossing symmetry tells you that you should not have a Koshika lattice. Well, unfortunately, that's not true. Even generically, it's not true. And that's an amazing result of the Fermos and Block from 2007. They show that it is in the C0 category, I'll not, I'll not explain what that is. The, there is no, you can have a Koshika horizon. In fact, you can have it generically. So that's not good news. Okay, so I should wrap up, right? Okay. So, very good. Uh, a very common, uh, very common question is that people look at here and say, the paper is uh, ready for the subject, and they see hundreds and hundreds of pages, and they say, why are the papers so long? Well, so here's an example of. Um, of a page from the book of this real information of crowd services. It's just one page, it's just one proposition. And the reason for the papers is so long, well, because there are systems of equations, many of them. The most important reason is that the behavior that we see 
is highly anisotropic. So even though you have tensor, so you can say, well, what's the big thing to deal with the tensor? You can deal with it abstract. You don't need to decompose your tensor relative to different directions. Well, here you do, because the behavior of the tensor is anisotropic. It depends on which components you look at. And so you have to analyze different components differently. And that has the place. Finally, <laughs> the final question is, what does it all have to do with PBS and uh, CBS? So if you hang around, let's say, uh, physics community, they will tell you that the most exciting thing that happens in gravity is the ads cft correspondence. And that has happened in the last 20 years. So what is ads cft Well, this is slightly about it. It's, 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 it's about slightly different class of space time, so it's slightly different topology. Here, the topology of the initial data is not R3. It's this SF plus. The boundary of your space time is R times SF times 1. And the, uh, the ads cft correspondence tells you that there is some conformal field theorem on the boundary, which is supposed to correspond to the theory of gravity, to the general theory of general, general theory of relativity in the box. And what we'll hear from physicists is that well, we have very complicated problems in conformal field theorem on the boundary, and this is a way to uh, rigorously reduce them to much simpler problems in general relativity, which are much better. Well, so what does that do with ABSCFT? Well, my answer to you is that it has to be mathematical. Absolutely mathematical. Moreover, to make matters worse, I just want you to focus on this one. The fact is that in this particular situation, very recently, in the last couple of years, Mosquitos showed that uh, your actual general relativity in, in the ball can exhibit weakly turbulent behavior. So, if you have weakly turbulent behavior in the ball, what do you see? What are you going to see? What correspondence with the conformal field theorem on the boundary? This has nothing to do with it. If, I'm not denying the, the fact that CFT, ADS CFT can be useful for something that can be provided, can provide fantastic motivations, but not for problems in general. This is about something else. And the reason for it is simply is that it should not be portrayed as a correspondence between conformal field theory and general relativity. It's a correspondence between conformal field theory. And some geometries in the ball, certainly not all geometries in the ball. It's not one to one correspondence, far from it. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Um, right. Difficult question again. Because, so, so, so to, the easy answer would be to say that there is an actual way of rigorously say that the curvature goes up. And indeed, curvature variants will do a lot of things. But that's, that's an easy answer. And it's not entirely correct. Because in some sense, the singularity that you see, uh, you see there is weaker than that. The fact that the curvature goes up does not bother me because I know how to solve problems where curvature is even. So, what you can show there is that, for instance, there are infinite type of forces. So, you, look at the, you can look at the uh, congruences of geodesics that go inside the singularity, and you can show that uh, the, the forces that arise in there are such that the observer will be born. So this is just a notion. Uh, if you wanted to measure uh, something becoming C at not at the level of curvature, but at the level one degree below that, one degree below that, there is a geometric you can describe a geometric. That's exactly what I would say. Yes, exactly. Uh, in this context, the one easy quantity that we have, the access to which we have, is the hockey mass. So for instance, you can show that the hockey mass, as you go into the twin, that, that point is very square, it's actually a point. It's not a sphere, it's a point of zero well, it's a sphere of radius zero. Uh, you can show that the Hawking mass is not able to zero to the radius square. So it's concentration. Okay. So you said the beginning that you're interested in studying the space of one two dimensions. So it sounds like natural to be at least to work on the intelligence of relation relativity using like the symmetric as one of the dynamic but when you said when you uh, 
showed a work that I'm just going to speak. You did mention it. Yeah. Are you work on So, certainly, certainly, there is such a thing as a combinatorial formulation of generality. Uh, it was designed, uh, for the most part, with the idea that people would use it to quantize values, because that's a typical road to quantization. Uh, however, for evolution topics, it's not so natural. For the simple reason that uh, splitting 3 plus 1 split is not a genetic split. There is no canonical time variable. At least as far as I'm concerned. So I prefer, I mean, I don't shy away, I work with this type of split. But it should, it's not a dog talk about it because in some situations, you don't want to choose a global time period. You might not be good at that. And, but when you actually come to the boundary of the Bushiki values, then certainly you have to work very, very well with There's no global time period at all. So that's the reason why I'm not really talking about it. I'm talking about it. But yes, that's certainly a part of it. Thank you.